At this time, I would like to introduce Colonel Michael T. McTie, Commandant of the Adjutant General School. General Beagle, Command Sergeant Major Gann, Colonel Aiton, Command Sergeant Major Escobedo, friends and family of Soldier Support Institute, Fort Jackson, and representatives from the Richmond County Sheriff's Office, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 23rd iteration of the MOD Leadership Lecture Series. It is my pleasure today to introduce today's guest speaker, Brigadier General Thomas T.J. Edwards. As you may have read in his bio, he's a native of South Carolina and a graduate of the University of South Carolina. He's held critical AG assignments at every level and is currently serving as the Chief General Officer Management Office in the Pentagon. Brigadier General Evans is one of only eight AG General Officers currently serving, and this being the home of the AG Corps results in a double homecoming for him. Given that this is the Lieutenant General Maud Leadership Lecture Series, named after the most senior officer killed in the 9-11 attack, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the significance of General Edwards speaking here today. Twice each year, we identify a senior leader to serve as the General Maud Lecture Speaker. All of our previous speakers have been remarkable leaders in their own right. However, few were actually at the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. General Edwards was present that day. He experienced firsthand the tragedy of that day and the loss of an amazing leader whom this lecture is named in honor of. He knew Lieutenant General Maude and saw in action how his love for soldiers and, and this country and his belief that there is no higher calling than service to our country. Sir, on behalf of the AG School, welcome home. It's an honor to have you speak today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage General Edwards. All right. Test, test. Test. Okay, you have to be smarter than the microphone here. All right. How's everybody doing? I'd just like to welcome you to the great state of South Carolina. How many of you are from South Carolina? Not too many. All right, so I know I'm the visitor, but let me say welcome to the best state in the nation, uh, South Carolina. Uh, smiling faces, beautiful places. If you're here as a student, you need to go out there and see uh, all that the state has to offer. Uh, I don't want to sound like a tourism uh, commercial, but uh, the Palmetto State is a, a fantastic place, especially if you're military. Uh, I'd like to, of course, start the introductions. Uh, appreciate the, the kind uh, introduction. Uh, but as Mike said, with our VIP guests, everybody here to me is a VIP. Um, let me just take a minute out and tell you, your, uh, your commanding General Fort Jackson, uh, General Beagle, is, uh, I, I happen to know, because of my current job, uh, all 300 plus general officers in the Army. And I would just tell you that Fort Jackson has probably one of our very, very best uh, general officers. And uh, that leadership is, is pretty inspiring. So, sir, thank you for being here. Uh, next, of course, uh, uh, all the leaders in the front row, again, I'm going to kind of dispense with uh, all the, the formalities, but the, the leaders that care about soldiers that are here, thank you for being here. Uh, certainly the students, I'll try and get through this kind of kind of quick. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I can relate to you, even though I'm an old, old guy. I'm going to try and relate to you, but again, a lot of my terms may be uh, uh, legacy terms, so just deal with it. Uh, you can correct me during the Q&A time. Um, for our Richland County Sheriff's, I'd like to just uh, have everybody help me give them an applause. I'd just like to say thanks for what uh, you men and women do. Uh, you guys are the sheep dogs that keep the wolves at bay, that herd the sheep, that take care of us. And uh, you know, I think Richland County, I probably owe you a couple tickets, been trying to outrun you for a while too. Uh, I am from the, the, the great uh, city of Darlington, South Carolina, so I have a bit of a lead foot, and I like to drive fast. Um, so uh, again, it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, today, most of my comments are going to be focused on being an AG officer, 
Uh, they tell you when you do public speaking, try to speak about something you know. And, and I, I'll tell you, I don't know a whole lot, but I know what it means to me to be an AG officer, and I'll tell you why I think the AG branch is one of the best branches in our Army to learn about leadership. So I start this slide off with, I became a soldier. Now, it's not all about me, and it's not all about you. Go back a slide, please. So I think I got a pointer here. And yet, yet OK, so this one is going to be about me. I used to be able to run. See that guy right there? University of South Carolina. I used to run track and cross country. I used to run a 359 mile. That was my fastest. I ran about a 407 average at University of South Carolina. And I, I usually finished second or third in NCAA Division I. So I was never you know, the best, but I, I gave it my best shot. Even back then, I think the new PT test would, would be hard for me. So I, I'm working hard now to stay in shape. Uh, I, I suggest you do the same thing. But all of us here became soldiers, right? We all had different reasons. We all have different experiences. Uh, you know, most of us in here have deployed. If, if you've been deployed, you know what it's like to be a part of a team and a family, uh, which is pretty important. Uh, go ahead and click the link. I became a soldier. I've got a short video to try and keep the Marines in here awake. They didn't join this team to win championships yeah. or become famous or get their own signature shoes. They join because there is important work to be done and only some able to do it. They are brighter, better educated, better trained, led, and equipped than any team in history. They are doctors, lawyers, engineers, mechanics, aviators, technologists, and combat troops, all prepared for whatever comes their way. You'll find them where the lights don't flash, and the only contract they sign is with themselves and their country. One day, they may be asked what they did to make a difference in this world, and they can respond, I became a soldier. Can I get a hula? That's what I'm talking about. You should be fired up right now. I know it's after lunch, but uh, that's good stuff. And you guys are all part of a team, right? You're all, even if you're not AG, you're, if you're finance, if you're infantry, if, you know, whatever part of the team you are, you're part of the U.S. Army, you're part of the Sheriff's Department, we're all part of a team. I think we continually uh, evolve, learn, develop. Uh, that's a lot of what I plan to talk about. And uh, again, I'm going to try and connect with you. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, I used to be one of you. Uh, way back when, I was the guy in every class that stood in the back uh, corner. Let's see, right back there. Back corner, I was always the back row kind of guy, so tried to hide. Um, and that, you know, I did have to do this in Technicolor because I figured, you know, black and white, uh, you know, that, that was back in one. So at any rate, when I was in what's now called Triple C, OBC, it was so long ago that the installation I went to is no longer open. And I see some retirees in here chuckling. Come on. If you went to Fort Ben Harrison in your life, raise your hand, please. All right, so I'm, yeah, there's some active duty out there too. That's awesome. But uh, Fort Ben, we called it Club Ben. It was a great place, uh, but it closed. Uh, but that's where I did my basic course. I also did the postal supervisor course. So all you postal students, raise your hand. Where are you at? Right here. Fantastic. Our joint team. Good stuff. So you moved from the bleachers, right? So I was wor a little worried about you up there in, in the bleachers, but uh, glad to have you here. Next slide, please. So then, of course, your natural progression. We call this in the Army, we call this the Army Leader Development Model, right? What do, what do you do for Army Leader Development? You do basically three things. You go to school to get educated and trained. You go out there and you do your assignment, and you learn, and you bust your ASS, and you learn hard, you work hard, you play hard, but you, you learn your proficient skills. And then what do you do? You do some self-directed stuff. You say, you know what, I'm really interested in this particular area. Or, hey, I want to go to school and get a master's degree in this particular area. It's that leader, Army leader development training model. I'll just tell folks that are here, again, congratulations, especially if you're AG. Uh, in the great state of South Carolina, foot stomp, uh, the AG headquarters right here in Columbia, South Carolina. 
uh, enjoy your school experience. I'll tell you that uh, in this picture, which is kind of faded and so forth, uh, I have several really close friends still to this day out of that, that class. Um, of course, we shared the hardships. Uh, at the time, they added rigor to our, our course, too. We went to the field back then, you know, we went out there and we, we were out there. We actually had these things called tax boxes. Anybody remember tax boxes with the lightning rod? You had to, anyway, I'm going way back. Uh, but bottom line is, even my best friend to this day is in this photo. Uh, my best friend and I stay in contact. Uh, and he's one of those guys, you probably have friends like this. They're really, really smart. They're really, really driven. And somewhere along the way, they get a little disillusioned. Do I really want this life? Do I really want to sacrifice this when I could be in a tree stand, you know, shooting deer, uh, when I can be at home with my family? Um, and he decides to get out. And he gets out, and he makes big money, and he has a, you know, beautiful family, I have 5,000 square foot home, has a lake home, has a, you know, couple boats, pontoon boats on a lake, uh, ha has it all, right? But you know what? Every time I talk to that guy, he misses the army. He misses you. He misses soldiers. That's what we have. It's pretty special to be a part of this team. Next slide, please. So I just want to, to share with you just overall, and I go back, the, the pictures aren't really important. What this is to represent to you is we all have different experiences, right? I mean, you look at people's bios, you see that some of us have done more training-related stuff. Some of us have done more institutional-level stuff. Some of us have spent lots of time muddy boots. And there's a place for all of that in our army. And, and people have different perspectives based on their experiences. So as young officers, I tell you, uh, to, to do your best, to talk to leaders, to have several different points of view. Don't just take one leader's, you know, especially if they say, here's what you should do. Uh, what's your gut tell you that you should do um, a, a, as a leader? So you're going to experience things. I certainly have. And I I show a couple of pictures up there. The top one up there is, is me in Iraq, and I wanted my team picture in the porta potties because we were, we were working until about 1, 2 o'clock every morning and starting about 7 o'clock. And so, you know, it, when you're walking to the chow hall, you got that bond experience, right? And so, you know, that, that picture is kind of like my Christmas card picture. You got to work hard, you got to play hard. You know, I, I got other pictures there where I've got uh, teams. And I'm just going to tell you, uh, in, on this team, on the AG team, or whatever team you belong to, you want to be the best that you can be. And you want to try to make sure your team stands out. Uh, not in a braggiocious kind of way, but in a way that shows that you're part of, a, of, of excellence and your team is better prepared, better led, and, and, and better run than any place else in the company, in the battalion, in the division, in the corps, you name it. Try to be the best that you can be. And rub that off on, on some people. Uh, now, Terry Mott, I, I know wasn't here, but the bottom right-hand picture, again, not the best picture. As was mentioned, I knew General Mott. Um, <clears throat> General Mott was one of those, those folks I, I automatically thought of. In fact, if you're a lieutenant out there, um, you might be able to relate, but I had this General Mott picture when he was a one-star general, and he came to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And, <clears throat> and General Mott, I escorted him around for two days. And the one thing that I remember that stuck out the most, besides he was pretty intense, was, and I don't think you can see it in that particular photograph, you can come up here and look at this later, but he was wearing this G.O. belt. And I don't think I've seen too many G.O.s wear their G.O. belt. I don't know, sir, if you wear your G.O. belt, but uh, it, it's a, uh, <clears throat> we had one four-star once say that when they issued him his G.O. belt, he put it on and he wore it around his house for a full day, naked. And that ruined it for me. <laughs> that really ruined it for me. So I'm not trying to give you guys any visual images, but let's just say that uh, this is a pretty belt, and all GOs get them. I don't see too many people wear them, but Tim Mott, he sported a GO belt. You knew he was in charge when he was around. It was, it was kind, of, kind of nice. All right, next slide, please. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, again, what it means to be an AG leader in our AG branch. Uh, to me, it, 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 again, we, we, get a, we let people talk bad about us. <laughs> uh, part of that's because we're in the combat service support end. Uh, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little shield, keep me off the battlefield. You've heard that? <laughs> Have you heard that? If you haven't, that's great. 
because the battlefield nowadays is everywhere, right? But no twinkle, twinkle, little shield. Look, push back. Say, hey, look, I, I got you. You know, every time I've deployed, I don't know about you, but I've deployed every time, the first thing we do is we put out force protection, right? We're going to take care of the safety of our team. What's the next thing you do? Well, how many people do we have? Hey, uh, when's my sol when are our soldiers getting mail? Um, hey, we had a casualty. How do we, you know, properly report that and do all the notifications? I mean, the stuff that we do as AG professionals, it matters. And we have to be there. We have to insert ourselves in the planning. We have to make sure that warfighters know that we support them. And you've got to continually exceed the standard for your warfighters. Let them know what you provide to the fight because they may not necessarily know. And, you know, again, it's easy for those on the tip of the spear to say, ah, oh, you know, whatever. But what you're providing, it, it matters because it matters if that NCO is not getting paid, right? It matters if that NCO doesn't get his promotion. Uh, it certainly matters if uh, a commander wants to award a soldier for great actions, great leadership, all those things that you do, they all, trust me, become very, very important to that commanding general of, of forces. Now, AG, we don't have a lot of advocacy, uh, but you need to be proud of being AG. And, and I think Columbia, South Carolina, and the great state that it is, should be proud to have the AG school here. Because the a AG leaders, we have usually about six or seven general officers. And if we're lucky, we have one three-star. Well, again, I work with all the general officers in the Army. I help the chief of staff assign those general officers. If you don't have a four-star in the room to speak, and there's only four stars in the room, you're not going to have a whole lot of advocacy. Now, General Perna, God bless him, he, he loves the AG Corps, he loves sustainers, and he does a great job. But what I'm saying is you don't have a four-star AG person in the room to, to, to tell your story. So you've got to be able to tell your story our AG general officers have to be able to tell your story and say why it's important and how it's important and what resources you need. And that's what guys up here in the front row uh, do every single day. My hat's off to them, uh, really off to them, because it's so important. So be proud of what you do. Be confident in what you do. Make sure your warfighters know what you can do for them, because every good leader that I've ever met, they want to take care of their soldiers, and they want to take care of their families. They want to take care of veterans. Next slide, please. So, and let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to jump one. I want to talk about some leadership lessons uh, that I've learned since, uh, <clears throat> basically since joining the Army. Next slide, please. It, you know, it's, it's all about taking care of soldiers and what we do to take care of soldiers and learning, learning as we go, as we take care of soldiers. So. Sorry about that. I'm losing my place in my, my lesson plan. I'm trying to stay on track here so that your time is good. But I, I want to tell you as, you, as you are out there in the field, as you're learning as a leader, if you're, whether you're new or you're old, you're, you should always be learning. And so I just wanted to share a couple quick things with you, a couple thoughts uh, before I wrap it all up. So the, the first thing I want to share with you, and, and this is how all good stories start, right? And there I was. And there I was. Uh, brand new second lieutenant, hungry, finished triple C, it used to be called OBC, finished airborne school. And I thought I was hot stuff, airborne school, right? I, I used to run a 942 mile time. I would run the two mile and then I would go back and help my, my uh, soldiers run. I, I was leading the way, I was hungry, I was driving, I was demanding. Uh, I got over to Germany and they had these things called RTEPs. Anybody ever hear of an RTEP? All right, mostly old school. RTEP stood for Army Readiness Training Evaluation Program. It basically was like an IG inspection, only it was inspecting how well you could do your mission. And I was the XO for a personnel service company. We used to have these things called PSCs. So we had our own nice unit. We had our own, uh, they called them cut Vs instead of hum Vs at the time. We had our own deuce and a halfs. So we had our generators. We had all the stuff we needed to go to the field, and we were going to have an RTEP. And my boss, he's a commander, says, okay, listen here, Lieutenant. Your evaluation rides on this and how well you do. Anybody ever have a boss like that? You're like, thank you, boss. Okay, I got it. My evaluation's riding on this. So <clears throat> your evaluation rides on this. And you're in charge of convoy operations. You're in charge of all the load plans. And, you know, 
one of the first things you got to do is make sure we roll out of the gates at 05, SP time, 05. You fail that, everything after that starts to fail. Uh, again, I'm high speed, I got this. For about a week and a half before we load out, I'm reviewing all the load plans. I'm calling my NCOs together and checking and questioning, are you sure that needs to be loaded first or second? Because how, you know, which ones are we gonna unload first? And you know, I'm going through, and I'm, I'm doing what you might call micromanagement a little bit, right? <clears throat> and the NCOs in the room, you can relate to this. So I, I just on them. And of course, the day comes and we're gonna roll out to the field in Germany, it's cold. It was cold. You could see your breath kind of cold. And it's just snowing left and right. And of course, I'm not going to miss SP at 5 o'clock. So when do I have my soldiers show up? 2 a.m. Nice. I, I was that lieutenant, right? I'm the man. So I got everybody showing up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And of course, they really love me. And they're out in their vehicles, and they're, they're, they're all asleep. And, and everything's running. But at least I know at 5 o'clock, we're rolling. Well, about five minutes till five, I see somebody climb out of one of these big deuce and a halfs. And I could just see the steam. The guy had a, a skull cap. He took it off. The steam just coming off of his head, right? And then I see another guy come up and start talking to him. They're both shaking their heads. And they start walking back down the convoy. I'm about midway. And I look, and of course, I'm, damn, we're, we got to go soon. I, I, all of a sudden, I see other people get out of the vehicles. And then I see a gaggle of NCOs. I said, well, something's not right. I jump out of there. You know, I'm going to fix it. All right, what's going on? What do we need to do? And I had this staff sergeant, Elmore Jones. Elmore. Elmore had, tree, uh, had arms bigger than oak trees, bigger than South Carolina oak trees. He was just a big man, about like seven foot. Elmore shook his head and says, hey, sir, we can't roll. I said, what do you mean we can't roll? Said, sir, we don't have the TREEs. I said, well, who the hell has them? And he said, I just shook his head. Last time I saw him, Sergeant Sokyu had him in the supply room. And Sergeant Sokyu was a Filipino uh, staff sergeant, my supply sergeant. He didn't speak English very well. And when he got excited, he spoke it even less well. And so I'm, Sergeant Sokyu, get down there, you know what's going on? I, I, I'm just firing him up. I see Erica Burton smiling back there because she's seen me spun up like this. I said, we, we got to go, we got to roll. Said, Sir, I don't know where the TRWs are. Oh, shit. I have now missed SP. So we slide down the hill. We go down to the supply room. It's one of those big bay kind of supply rooms. We open the doors. I'm in there. I'm, I'm personally tearing apart stuff. And the NCOs are looking at me, and they, they kind of gravitate down at the end of the bay where the snow's falling. And again, I've missed SP. The big Sergeant Jones shakes his head, hey, LT, come here a second. And I walk down there, and they're chuckling. But right about now, I don't find anything funny. He says, hey, LT, there's plenty of trees where we're going in the woods. I said, what? He said, TRWEs, trees, there's plenty of them out in the woods. Yeah, this is, this is a good leadership lesson here. Stay with me. <laughs> Stay with me because, you know, the inside voice in me says, I want to kill this guy, right? But he's got a whole posse of people who just whooped my butt too. Um, and the leadership lesson I took from it was he said, LT, said, you can do this with us or without us. You know, you've got the best NCOs in the entire group. you got people who know their jobs. Let us do it for you. Let us help you. Let us make you successful. That was a powerful lesson for me. And the lesson is not only to listen, but to, to let others lead. You know, there's tons of lessons there, but I just share that with you, especially you new leaders. You've got a ton of resources out there. Uh, soldiers that have been doing things. And it doesn't matter the rank, but l let everyone have their, their chance to lead. They're going to fail, too. You've got to be there as a leader to help them if they fail, pick them up. Uh, you're going to learn other things, <clears throat> but each assignment you take, each one of those assignments, I tell you, you've got to try to figure out what can you learn and what value can you add to the organization. Some of you may have heard Jim Collins. He wrote a book, Good to Great. And Jim Collins talks about you know, a, a level five leader or a leader that is in an organization, and when they leave that organization, people know it because they did so much it's felt right away. You probably have soldiers like that in your formation. They go on leave even if it's three or four days. You feel it. You want to be that kind of person. You want to be someone that's missed when they're not there and makes a difference. You don't want to be the single point of failure, 
don't get me wrong, you want other people that can do what you do, you want to train other people, but you want to have such an impact that when you're not there, it, there there's something that's missing. So, you learn as you go. AG branch, you know why we're one of the best damn branches in the Army? Because, quite frankly, AG officers at a real early age, we're working at the battalion, the brigade, the division, the corps, the Army levels. We're working with senior leaders right away as young officers, right? You're working for some of the best leadership in the Army, incredible leadership. Our, our general officers in particular, and, and I'll tell you, there's no perfect leader. Everybody, everybody, even the best leaders have bad days and they have faults, but you have some that are just special. And as AG leaders, you get to see those people, you get a front row seat up close with senior leaders. And guess what? Again, they all want to take care of their people. So you get that front row seat, leadership seat. Watch how they take care of people. Watch how those leaders inspire others. Watch how they, they, they take care of their teams and they build their teams and try to figure out how you can help that senior commander, how you can help those leaders do an even better job. Connect that leader to, to the people, taking care of people, and you will go far in our AG branch. I talked about being the best team, being the best team member. You gotta also be a, a, a team member, not just the team leader. You gotta be a good member of a team. Uh, I, I believe I talked a little bit about mentorship and seeking mentors out. Uh, it's also, you gotta remember, uh, important to have fun, got to have fun, um, and, and you're going to make mistakes. Um, not saying that you need to have fun and make mistakes at the same time. If you make mistakes, make sure they're not unrecoverable mistakes. We have a few of those. We're not a zero defects type army. I heard, uh, uh, and this isn't a religious statement, but I heard Joel Olstein one time speak. And he said, do you know why there's dimples in the golf ball? Well, hell, I'm not a golfer, but it never occurred to me why they have dimples in a golf ball. He said, have you ever tried to hit a perfectly smooth golf ball? He said, aerodynamically, a perfectly smooth golf ball will only go so far. But a golf ball with dents in it goes twice as far. And the point he's making is we all have dents. We're, none of us are perfect. Even your best leaders have dents. But you as a leader in your development as you continue to come up, do your best to overlook some of those dents, especially if they're your soldiers that are messing up, show them how to be better. Show them how to grow from those mistakes. Be that leader that you want to work for. Be that leader that you want to work for and do unto others what you wish they would do to you. And I tell you, it's not that hard. It's pretty simple, actually. But the simple stuff is hard. It can be hard, especially in a culture and some environments that we're put in. <clears throat> so I'm going to go to one last war story and close it out here. So I told you about the lieutenant time. And I got Steve Ayton in the room here. Where's Steve at? Steve, all right. So Brother Ayton uh, commanded after me. Uh, he's still cleaning up my mess there, I'm sure. But uh, at Fort Knox, we commanded the garrison. And I talked to the garrison commander and command sergeant major here. My hat's off to you. Tough job. So there I was. Another there I was story. My last one, by the way. Garrison command, Fort Knox, Kentucky. They say Kentucky's in the south, but I tell you, it snows there pretty hard. And one day, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it started snowing. And it was cold the day before. It was even colder the day before, but the snow really started to come down. And I get this phone call from my fire chief, Fire Chief Gunderson, great American, 22-year uh, veteran in the Air Force, just total service, kind of like our, our sheriff's departments here. And we, we had this, you know, the, the police team. We had our fire team, our, our emergency responders. Well, they got... Uh, they, they had about 15 911 calls of gas leaks, leaks smelling, you know, in housing. And, uh, and the fire chief said, hey, sir, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Uh, 15 calls in the last hour on gas leaks, something's not right. So I said, yeah, yeah you're right. That, so, you know, keep me informed. And I talked to my deputy. He says, well, you know, sometimes this happens. It, we got some old lines in different places. Uh, and nothing to worry about. The next call I get is from our emergency operations cell. Hey, sir, uh, I advise, I recommend, this is Ken Boglin, like the G3 civilian there. Hey, I recommend we stand up a, a, a CAT team. I said, what do you mean a CAT team? Hey, well, we have about 60 911 phone calls into the fire department for uh, natural gas leaks. I said, what? 60 natural gas leaks? And he said, yes, sir. And, you know, those resources, 
we, we have to go into every one of those quarters and sn use a sniffer and see where the leak is at. Right now, we've only cleared about four or five houses. We haven't found anything, any leaks, but, you know, the reports back are it's bad. You can smell it. You can smell it. So we stood up the, the, the emergency operation room. You know where I'm talking about, down in this basement. I had people there from all over the garrison. You got to have your MWR team. You know, you got pe you know, people with child care issues. You got the schools, the school liaisons. You got all the units there, everybody unit-wise. Of course, everybody's also at the same time wondering if we're going to close down the post because the roads are starting to get bad. We had up to about 90 phone calls into 911 about gas leaks, so something's going on. And about that time, in today's world, uh, especially in the, uh, the housing area right now, as you know, and, and other places, social media can take off like a virus. And social media started saying, hey, everyone on my block, it's so bad that people have their windows open, and their doors open, and it's snowing like crazy. About that time, my PAO for the Post says, hey, sir, we got Fox Channel whatever out at the Post and CBS. Uh, they want to interview you and find out what, what, what's going on and what your plan is uh, to evacuate these residents. Now, at this point, it's a whole neighborhood, over 120 houses. What is your plan? I'm, I'm there and I've got my G3 saying, hey, sir, we got to make a call here if we're going to evacuate this housing in the next hour. We got to we either evacuate it uh, or, or, you know, we're going to be in, in deep trouble. Risk climbs exponentially. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm sitting there, my MWR guy says, hey, sir, if you evacuate people, I'm going to have to close down three gyms. You know, we're going to have to use three gyms. But I'm getting all the problems, right? I'm getting all the... The, the, the challenges associated with that cost of action. Hey, sir, uh, LRC, hey, uh, if you're going to need food. And I'm going to have to let a contract for so many meals. We're going to have to bring in extra uh, showers, extra. Now, granted, keep in mind here, I'm an AG officer. AG officer, I can do the hell out of some admin, but I don't know anything about natural gas and gas leaks. But you're in charge, right? And what, what am I doing? I'm seeking input. But at a certain point, you have to be decisive you have to be able, ready to make a decision. Well, I was really close to making a decision, but I wanted just every bit of data that I could get at that moment. And I had about 10 more minutes before it was going to get dark, and then we we're going to evacuate hundreds of people and families and dogs into shelters and still have to contract for cots and all the other challenges that came with it. Just before I, I made the decision, I said, let me ask you a question. What is different today? What is different than today than yesterday? And the room got quiet. I said, no, seriously, why, why do we have all the you know, hundreds of calls on gas leaks? Why today? Why not yesterday? Did anybody call about a gas leak yesterday? No, no, no one called. I said, well, well what, what the hell? Why, what, what is different right now? My gut told me, my gut as a leader, not as an AG leader, my gut told me something's different today than yesterday. Well, sir, we'll call. We'll find out. We call the utility. We're calling. Sure enough, about two minutes later, hey, sir, different today than yesterday. We're using a different gas company. I said, okay, that's a start. Hold on before we're evacuating. What do you mean we're using a different gas company? Well, up until now, we used Louisville Gas and Electric, and they were charging the hell out of some gas prices, and we got it extra cheap through Texas gas and oil, and so we're buying Texas now. I said, okay, that's a start. So what else is different? Well, hold on, we'll find out. In that space of time, hold on, you got the media going, you got the social media, you got the spouses and others that are really ticked off, and kids that, you know, we're talking lots of stuff going on, right? Get this phone call. Okay, here's the deal. Every day, we have the Marine Corps, that's for the Marines out there, retired Marine Corps, Gunny, Jimmy. And Jimmy, every day, he puts seven scoops of Mercacidin into the natural gas line. I said, oh, okay, what does that mean? Mercacin. Well, mercacin is that thing that you put in to natural gas and make it smell like rotten eggs. Everybody tracking with me what natural gas smells like? That, that nasty natural egg smell. So I said, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, when we bought Louisville gas, it didn't have mercacin in it, so Jimmy's Seven Scoops made it so that if there was a leak, you would smell it right away because the, you know, the egg smell. But the Texas gas that we bought and we started coming through the lines today already had all the mercacin in it it needed. So when Jimmy put his seven scoops in there, 
He like triple macassaded. So we got like triple the rotten egg smell that we normally have. And so the only thing that changed between the day before and that day was we added a whole bunch of rotten egg mercassin and smell to the natural gas. There were no leaks, but if you are smelling natural gas, you think there's a leak, right? It, it wasn't there were leaks, it was just all that extra nasty smell and stuff. So we then had to go out and communicate, hey, it's, it, there's no leaks, here's what's going on. We'll have a fire department come through, we'll clear it, you keep your windows open, all that kind of stuff. We got through all that. What I'm saying is the leadership lesson there for me was make sure you trust your gut in some cases. You know, you're going to have to make hard calls that will impact a lot of lives. And if you're AG, you can do all kinds of different jobs like Garrison Command and other things. Leadership is leadership. you got to stand by your decisions. You're going to be held accountable for your decisions. Uh, try to make sure it's a well-informed decision. Again, maybe, perhaps, I learned from my lieutenant days to listen uh, to the people around me. But sometimes a lot of things that you hear is just chatter. At the end of the day, you're the leader. You've got to make the hard call. Be prepared to make the hard call and be prepared to stand by it. All right, so I guess in closing, I want to uh, thank you for inviting me home to the great state of South Carolina. And uh, I was fired up today, even before the lecture, walking around talking to a lot of you. Uh, I, I think we can all learn from each other. Uh, I'm fired up to be a soldier. I'm very proud to be an AG soldier. I'm very proud to be back home. Now, I work for a very, very tough but inspiring leader, and his name is Mark A. Milley, the Chief of Staff. Uh, if confirmed, he'll be the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs next. He, he is all about winning. He's all about readiness. He's all about winning. And uh, he, he inspires me. I uh, should inspire you uh, as leaders. Again, as AG leaders, it's your job to get out there and make a difference, help commanders take care of their soldiers. I just want to leave you with uh, one more video, and then I'll open it up to questions and answers. But one more video uh, using my boss's words. The thing about his leadership I'll tell you about is Mark Milley, General Mark Milley, he's an authentic leader. He believes what he says and says what he believes. And listen to the words of this. I think many of us in this room subscribe to the same values and beliefs. Go ahead, please. Here in America, we will have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Regardless of whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, it doesn't matter if you are black or white or Asian or Indian, or any other ethnic group. It doesn't matter what your country of origin is, or the spelling, your last name. It does not matter if you are Catholic or Protestant, Muslim or Jew, and it doesn't matter if you don't believe at all. It does not matter if you're rich or poor or common or famous. In this country, in these United States, under those colors of red, white, and blue, in this country, all Americans are created free and equal, and we will rise or fall based on our merit we will be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. That is the core organizing principle of the United States of America, and that is why we fight. At this time, the Q&A will begin with General Edwards. Please move to the center aisle where an usher will be with a microphone. This is always that uncomfortable time when no one really wants to grab the microphone, be that guy or gal, I get that. Um, you know, I'm here, I don't, by the way, I, I don't have all the right answers either, uh, but I'll give it my best shot. So please, by all means. Yes, ma'am. Sir, Captain Borgar, AG, Triple C, 19002. Sir, in your opinion, what do you think are the three, or are three most important leadership skills one must possess or develop to become successful in a command position or a staff position? Wow, that's a, that's a shotgun blast there. I, <laughs> whew. Anybody else want to take that one on? Uh, I, I think uh, I mentioned one of the things you have to have regardless of staff or command is, uh, li please have a seat, uh, li listening to uh, your people. Um, really, that's why I love being AG. It's all about people. 
but investing in your people, listening to your people, building the best team you can so that when someone tells you that the sky outside is purple, you don't have to go look out the window. You just know it's purple. You know, listening, to, having that kind of faith and confidence in the, the, the team that works for you, I think that's important whether you're staff or whether you're command. Uh, I think, you know, certainly you, you have to have good judgment skills as a, a staff or a commander. Um, and, and not all of us have intuitive, great judgment skills. Let's face it, we, that too we continually develop. Um, I know uh, even to this day I continue to develop that. Uh, and, and you try to get smarter, you know, that a lot of people talk about in, emotional intelligence. You try to get smarter in terms of, you know, if you're trying to negotiate or win an issue, uh, to, to only say so much or, or, you know, look for commonalities, um, but having that the right amount of judgment. So judgment as a staff officer, judgment as a, a commander is really key because the people you work for expect you to exercise great judgment. They expect you to take care of the team that you just built and the people that you trust. Uh, I, I think Ultimately, the, the last thing I'd say is, uh, as both a staff and a commander, you have to have a, a good situational awareness. Uh, and when I say situational awareness, it's kind of very broad. Uh, it could be considered some of that's judgment to uh, some of that's your team, but situational awareness so that you know what your boss's issues are. You know what he or she, what, what are their important objectives. What's, what does success look like to them? How about their boss's boss? How do you nest within that? Um, you know, your situational awareness of what's going on around you in the Army. Um, you know, what, what is it that you're focused on, your team's focused on? How does that plug into the different types of layers? And it's also situational awareness, uh, just like the other day. Um, I, I know for a fact when General Milley, my boss, goes over to testify on the Hill, he, he gets a little stressed out, and he's, you know, getting about 100 pounds to put in a 25-pound bag. He's, they're, they're trying to brief him up on every single Army program in case a senator or congressman asks him the question. And so from a situational awareness standpoint, I know that, you know, he's on pins and needles, and his time is very tight, and his temper may be way, way up. If I've got something that can wait until tomorrow to talk to him about, I'm probably better off waiting until tomorrow to talk to him about it, right? Because I'm situationally aware that uh, he is probably going to chew my ass if I walk in there and ask him something that can wait till tomorrow when he's going to go over on the hill and testify. It just got kind of situational awareness throughout your time. That includes, you know, being around your soldiers. If you have soldiers that have family issues, being situationally aware of your soldiers' issues and maybe what they need or what they, they may need. Uh, having situational awareness, kind of 360. And probably the last thing is a staff officer or, or commander is being situational aware of how your guidance, how your leadership is impacting those that work for you. Because you may, a lot of us don't think, you, know, you don't look at yourself with the objective eye, looking outside of your body kind of thing. And, uh, and you should. You should think to yourself, okay, I'm making this decision. What are the second, third order impacts of this? How, how am I being perceived as a leader? Uh, are my actions truly in the best interest of the organization, of the soldier, or, or are they personal? Is this about me? When it's about you, as a staff officer or commander, you're, 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 you're going off the path, and you're, gonna, you're probably going to fail at some point. Um, so those three things, I just kind of pull them out of a hat, but I'd, I'd say situational awareness and your judgment and building the right teams and listening to those teams. Thank you. Sir? Captain Michael Croson, AG CCC Class 0219. My question is, with the upcoming changes to our SRC-12 structure, loss of personnel within our G1s, and potential for large-scale combat operations, what do you think our current state of the AG Corps is? Yeah, no, that's, that's a real easy question to answer. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, truthfully, I am not so plugged into the AG Corps. Because of my time as a garrison commander, now my time managing general officers, um, uh, but I, you know, I, I embrace the AG world. That's uh, that's in my DNA. I, I think I'll go back to what I said. I remember being in Triple C. Uh, it was called the Advanced Course. Uh, I remember those days, and I remember being worried. I remember worrying about 
you know, is there a future? You know, if, if I'm, if, I want to always be competitive, right? Am I going to be able to go as far as I want to go in the AG Corps? Or is this like a dead-end branch? I mean, is it basically you can't go but so high? Or it's going to be going away? Well, let, let me just tell you, we've been around since 1775. 1775, right? George Washington, he wants to raise an army. What does he do? He grabs a ratio gates. We're the first damn branch, all right? AG branch. We're going to be around. You know why we're going to be around? Because war fighters need us. And they need to take care of people. And you've got to be that soldier that takes care of those people. And so I would tell you that, yes, what's the easiest thing to cut? Uh, we are low-hanging fruit. We don't have the three-star, four-stars in a lot of these meetings when they say, oh, well, shoot, you can just take five or six soldiers from here. That's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be a problem because no one's going to be jumping up and down at the three-star, four-star level. It's a problem if you want to move mail. Or it's a problem if you want to do doctrine development. It's a problem. Uh, it's just sometimes we assume away problems. <clears throat> Again, nothing new. We've done this as an army all the time. Uh, I would say that resources are always going to be constrained, but it'll get fixed as long as leaders focus on it. And so, you know, the, the team that's here at the schoolhouse, for example, every single day they continue to say, you can do this, but here's the risk. So that discussion is very, very important. Having the right people in the jobs to highlight those risks, very, very important. But having leadership, especially at the top, they have to know. We have to articulate to them, here's why we need this resource to take care of your soldiers. You're, you want this done, you want a uh, large-scale contingency operation, and you're gonna lose, let's just say you lose 200 soldiers one day. We, how are we gonna do that as AG professionals if they've cut away every single uh, you know, soldier that's supposed to run replacement operations, if they've taken all the vehicles and equipment away from a unit that's supposed to do, how are you gonna do? We, we will be in a world of hurt if that happens, and guess what? We will soon get the resources needed, but by then, we will have paid a price. So hopefully it doesn't get to the point of paying a price. I'm optimistic, um, but, you know, have faith. We're going to be around. We just have to do a better job as a community, as a core, articulating why we need what we need, and then resourcing. Good question. Yes, ma'am. I can repeat the question, but... Who are the Bulldogs? <laughs> All right, I'm saying again. Uh, my name is Cadet McCoy. I'm from South Carolina State University. I serve currently as the S3 of my battalion. So my question for you, sir, is as a brand new AG officer, soon to be, um, who? what can I do to be prepared for that? Yeah, just stay away from the CG who's also a South Carolina State grad and probably wants you to go infantry. <laughs> All right? Um, what can you do to prepare for that? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I tell you, um, for, you know, just like most of us, uh, stay out of jail, right? <laughs> Dude, you know, eat well, PT, right? Um, I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in ROTC, we had the ROTC Nazis, and I, there's nothing wrong with that if that's your dig, right? Um, and so you can sharpen your edge there through ROTC. Um, I would tell you, though, enjoy your time before you come in the Army, because once you come in the Army, we own you. And we are going to get our blood out of you, okay? But you're going to work hard. When you come in, be ready to go. Be ready to just be, submerge yourself, learn everything you can, network with the people that you're with. You're joining the best branch in the Army, in my opinion. Now, you're not going to be a four-star. Uh, some, some in other branches will. But if you want to make a difference in our Army, we're the best branch to do it. So congratulations. All right, uh, make sure that no one goes back to General Milley and tells him that I said AG branch is better than the infantry or special forces. Uh, just a caveat there, it's the best branch to me. And I am talking about what's good to me, right? Um, I acknowledge that we are very, very small in the Army, but I just tell you, uh, I'm very proud of being an AG officer. I'm very proud of what we do for the war fighters and for our soldiers and for our families and for our communities. Uh, we kick ass. We punch above our weight class. And we should be proud of that. So when someone says, twinkle, twinkle, little shield, you tell them, let me show you my shield. And I'll take you home on your shield. 
You've got to be able to go toe-to-toe with the warfighter. That counts on everything. You're a soldier. You're always a soldier. But show the warfighter that you know how to take care of soldiers, and they'll love you. And most of our, I get phone calls every day, I guess because I'm in GOMO, and it's some division commander or, or some CG, three-star, four-star, says, hey, let me tell you, I got the best officer that's an AG officer. I mean, General Abrams had an aide that was AG as his, you know, as his aide because he's that sharp before he went up to be 10th Mountain G1. We've got great talent out there. You guys are highly talented. Don't let anybody put you down because you're AG. If, and if anything, work harder to show your value, show your worth, and prove it. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, I'm Mr. Campbell. I'm here with uh, old bit class 02-19. They're all sitting right back here. <laughs> all right, that's the war officer waffle, folks. <laughs> I'm watching you now. So my question to you is with the new Army PT test coming up, how are we going to, how do you think we'll change the culture of the Army uh, as far as, would you go to different installations like Fort Bragg, PT is running every morning, probably 10 miles. Yep. So just running is not going to be enough for us to, uh, passes the PT test, so we're going to have to do other stuff for PT besides run. So how do you foresee us changing the culture across the Army, getting out and just running every day, and getting soldiers into gyms in the morning, and get, getting soldiers into doing other stuff besides running and rugging for crazy long distances? Proud Chief, I got you. Hey, uh, you know, I'm standing up here, I showed you back in the day when I weighed 30 pounds less and I was running 20 miles a day, uh, that's not me anymore. So if anybody's nervous in this room, about the next PT test, you're looking at the Muldoon who's nervous. In fact, I've got it on my calendar now. Every day, you can ask my guys at noon, I get the calendar reminder, and, you know, I talk about the leg ups. I talk about, you know, things I got to get after because I don't want to be that Muldoon that fails it. Um, and, you know, it's going to be hard. And you know what? The, the chief and others don't care if it's hard. They want it to be hard. They want to have rigor. They want us to change our mindset. Everything you said, is it going to be easy? Hell no. Not if you're as old as you are, Chief. <laughs> yeah, say, say I'm just, hey, look, if you're 18, but you're 35, right? It's going to be hard. And you've been doing PT kind of like the rest of us, push-ups, sit-ups, running. Running is currency at Fort Bragg. I was in the 82nd. We'd run eight, nine miles every day. If you couldn't run, you, you had no bank. Right, Steve Aiden? You've got to run. You, running, if you can't run, if you fall out, that shows where you stood. This new PT paradigm changes some of that. I think units are obviously going to have to completely change how they train PT. I'm not a professional trainer or anything like that. I'll just tell you, it won't be easy. It'll have to start in the schools. We'll have to inculcate that. The other challenge, of course, is equipment and making sure it's all fielded, making sure it's in the right places. It's not going to be something simple where you can say, okay, hey, let's go just do a diagnostic. Come on over here. Let's do these three events. No, this, you're going to have to plan this son of a gun. You're going to have to plan because you've got to have the right people trained to grade it. There's all, this is a whole different layer of complexity. But trust me, the end state is that we're better prepared for war. I, I, I think they're still testing it and getting results. So I have faith that in the, in the long run, we will all have a test that will challenge us. We'll all have a test that won't be impossible uh, to, to, to take. But it, it's definitely going to be a paradigm shift for those of us who've been in Army form today. I don't know if I answered your question, Chief, but that's kind of what I got for you. Cool. I didn't mean to call you old 35, you know, shoot. There you go. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're, I'm getting the wave of, uh, hey, get the hell off the stage. Okay. <laughs> See, I can take hand and arm signals. Um, anybody ever hear of Darius Rucker? All right. So I'm, I went to school, University of South Carolina. And Darius Rucker, at the time, Hootie and the Blowfish, they would come to my fraternity and play for free beer. I kid you not. They would play for free beer. And so, and I, guess what? I, was, I did the track thing. I did the fraternity. I was vice president, the social guy. I did, you know, did the Razzi Nazi thing. I, 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 I went to school part-time, right? But, so I'd have Darius Rucker playing all the darn time. Then, like my senior year, he started to get well-known, and it was like $1,000 a gig. Anyway. Darius Rucker is from the great state of South Carolina, I think down near the Charleston area. He has a song, and the song's called Life is Too Short. It really is. I just lost my dad last week, uh, God rest his soul, and uh, he was a former soldier, and uh, life is short, right? And his song says, uh, 
I don't call Carolina just a place I visit. I call Carolina home. I don't like drinking beer. I love it. That's true, too. On the back porch swinging with my honey. Life's too short just to like it. So you better get to loving it. This life before it's gone. Life's too short. You better get to living. So life is short, guys. Your Army career will go before you in a blink. Life is short. Get to living. and Have some fun. I appreciate all your time. It is great to be home. And it's great to be with soldiers. I love you all. Thank you very much. Cool.